Society. I hope everyone's well. Back in this level two with this lockdown means we get a bit more uh, freedom to move around and so on. But we still can't go back to the starting yet. Um, you would have seen in the email that came out earlier, we're looking at holding the AGM next Monday evening. And um, the idea will be that that will be an on completely online meeting. Um, we've got two methods of voting. There's a show of hands feature in Microsoft Teams that we're going to use. And um, also, um, if we have to do a, uh, a secret ballot, we're going to use SurveyMonkey to do that. But we'll send out a um, communication towards the end of the week explaining how it's all going to work. I've had reasonable response so far, so um, hopeful we'll be able to go ahead with it. So um, what I'm uh, showing you here, I'm going to talk about tonight, is some of the uh, planetarium software, com various computer software that we can use to aid in our observing. But uh, some of these programs can also control telescopes for um, go-to operations and some of them even integrate with cameras and things like that. But I'm going to mainly talk about the freeware ones that um, people can um, get and play with without outlaying any funds. So you'll see on the screen here, this is Stellarium, it's the latest version 20.1. And I'm going to um, talk through what we can do with it and actually answer a question that came up on the astrophotography group today um, to do with coordinates and um, uh, making sure the amount is um, being fed the correct coordinates, for, especially for things like polar alignment. So I will start off the way all these programs work. First of all, when you get them, make sure you go to the official website. Don't um, sort of download it from some arbitrary place on the internet just for security reasons, especially with freeware stuff. Um, go to the official stellarium.org website for this one and you'll see on the main page there it has instructions for downloading for the different operating systems. I'm showing you here is on Windows 10, but it works on Apple and various Linux distributions as well. The first thing you'll need to do when you set your program up is this. You notice that when I move the mouse over to the left, a little menu pops up. First one at the top there is the location window. And this is where you tell the program where you are. So in this case, um, it already knew about Auckland and the um, latitude and longitude. If you want to be exact and say you've got a, a specific home site you're interested in or it's not a city in the database, you just enter the latitude and longitude that you can get from a smartphone or off a map. So um, you'll see that it's just put in the default for Auckland 3651 South, 17446 East. And... You don't have to stick with that, of course, because you may want to see what the sky looks like from somewhere else. So if you want to be somewhere in the northern hemisphere, then you can just change and change back as you like. So that just makes sure that it, um, it understands what the time means in terms of your um, location and date and that kind of thing. I'll just get rid of that. The next thing we can do here is select the time. By default, Stellarium uses the system clock on your computer. So it's showing the current time and date. You can change that to whatever you like. We can go to next year, and you notice there was a slight shift. And um, if we want to go back, um, in the help it actually explains there's a whole lot of keyboard shortcuts. And to do that, we just deselect the time function there, hit the number eight, and it puts us back to where we are. If you have a look under the help, it has a list of all these keyboard shortcuts. So if you, um, for example, were wanting to plan your session, but you weren't going to start observing to 10 p.m., you just click forward to 10, and you'll see 
what's happening in the sky. Some other useful things in here down the bottom bar. There's a whole lot of features that we have quick access to to turn on or off. And one thing that I normally run this with is the cardinal points. Um, so you can immediately see where the where you're actually looking in the sky. I mean, it's pretty obvious when you see the Milky Way rising like that, that you're in the east, but it's quite useful if um, you, especially if you zoomed in and you may not recognise where it's actually pointing and if you don't have any star labels turned on. So there's some other things here. We can turn on constellation lines showing the, um, the uh, line um, drawings representing the constellations. We can turn labels on, which is quite useful. Um, probably this is something I don't use often, but it's the art. But if you're showing somebody um, about the sky, you might want to show them the traditional, this is the Western figures. Uh, it has other um, um, cultural um, star law built into it as well, and you can change that in the menu. And you've got coordinate grid. Equatorial is what probably astronomers mostly use. And alt azimuth, you can have both, both coordinate grid displayed at once. So I've turned equatorial on, and that's just showing alt azimuth. Um, probably the alt az is quite useful if you want to um, see um, without selecting the detail how high something is in the sky and the compass bearing. We also have, uh, oh, oh, that's a, a curious feature. You can simulate um, ground fog so um, and the atmosphere. So those things are kind of amusing. So, but they, they're quite good if you want to give a realistic view of what the sky is going to look like. Have um, planet labels we can turn on and off. I'll leave those on. Um, and this um, centre here, say I select Jupiter, and then I want to centre the object. And then what I can do is use the mouse wheel to scroll in. Now, if I hadn't centred it, um, what will happen is that the, the planet will drift because it's basically showing you a fixed position in the sky. So, in fact, if I turn that off, you'll see that it starts to drift, just like um, you um, see happen if it were in a Dobsonian telescope that isn't tracking. So if we want to bring it back, we can just select the, that button there and it brings Jupiter back into the centre. And we can see showing the position of the moons and those are in real time. So it's quite handy if you want to see where the moons are or identify the moons when you, you're looking for a telescope. You can go back to your screen to see which moon is which. To aid with that, actually, at the telescope, we can turn on night view mode, which changes everything to red. Um, you can also dim the screen as well if it's still too bright, just using your um, your computer screen dimming. So we'll take that off. Another um, handy feature, if you're into meteor showers, it will show you the radiant position. For example, I've zoomed out. The Eta Aquarids radiant is from that point there. We can turn those off. You can also turn satellites on and off if you have the TLEs loaded for the satellites. So let's um, go into um, the main settings screen. And this is where we can... Um, select some of these things for stars, you can turn them off, which you wouldn't normally want to do, but you can have them twinkle, you can simulate twinkle. You can also change the way the labels are displayed. We, we can turn them completely off. If you turn them on, you notice um, that one came up there. It's got Altia and some others. If we um, move the slider along, 
it will label more and more stars until it gets a bit ridiculous. So you just want um, a um, suitable balance of names if you want the star names for the view. If you go out of that and you zoom in, you'll see names start popping up. And so the way it labels things not only depends on that um, slider, but also how far you zoomed in. So if we zoom right out, we've still got a lot of stars there. I'll go back into that setting. And we'll turn a lot of those off. But some of them will start to come back again if we zoom in, such as if you see formal work there, it disappears at a certain zoom level. So that's just to make um, the screen a bit easier to um, see at any given zoom level. You just have the, the main information you're interested in. So another thing I was going to show is not on this screen. I would go to the um, marking screen. So we can actually turn on the um, things like the um, equatorial grid and so on from here. And I'm going to do that. And you can also turn some things that aren't on the fast selector buttons. We want to put the equator. And we're not going to use the equator J2000. We'll put the equator of date. And we're going to also put the ecliptic of date. So if I take that off the screen and zoom out. Um, the other thing I want to do is actually uh, in the sky settings, we want to make sure in the landscape that we've got the ground turned on. Um, I didn't have that turned on before. Under this, you can select a number of different views, ground views. They're just sort of made up things, but you can actually even load your own. Um, so I've got a particular face, place here in, in France. Um, it's simulating the ground for it at the moment. Uh, anyway, I'm going to turn the compass bearings back on. And we'll go around to the south. And somebody was asking about um, celestial coordinates and what this J2000 means or coordinates of date. You can see these two lines crossing here. We have the celestial equator, and that's just the Earth's um, equator of rotation projected onto the sky. So it's at the point 90 degrees between the two poles or the halfway point between the two poles projected onto the sky. And so basically a star that is exactly on the equator will move along the equator across the sky as the Earth rotates. Um, the sun and the planets don't follow that line. They follow, um, in the case of the sun, along the ecliptic line. The planets and the moon are usually just a little above or below the line. And it's called the ecliptic because when the moon is crossing the ecliptic and if it happens to coincide with the position of the sun, you get a solar eclipse. If the moon was crossing at the same time, and you can see the crossing point there, if, um, at certain points the um, these things can cross the ecliptic. So um, that's because the Earth's axis of rotation is tilted around 23 degrees to the ecliptic. So um, the ecliptic is the, basically the um, plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. And we have the crossing point where the sun is crossing from um, south to north. It's called the vernal equinox, so the um, northern equinox spring is basically the zero point for the coordinates. Now, just to see what effect this can have, if we zoom down to um, the South Celestial Pole, I've selected Polaris Australis, which is a near, quite faint, nearly 
nearly as faint as six magnitude star. That's the uh, also called Sigma Octantis, the South Pole star. Very difficult to see with the naked eye if you've got to have good vision on the dark side, dark sky. Now I'm going to um, go forward and change the date here. So we'll go forward 7,000 years and we'll notice the time of day has changed. So we're going to fix that up a bit. And let's fix the coordinates up. Okay, that's curious. The one that I turned off from on from the screen is actually overlaid there. I didn't actually know that, so we better fix fix that up. Turn that one off. So it didn't recompute the um, the equatorial grid, but when I do it through here, it's done it. And we can see that. Um, the South Pole is now in the constellation Carina, and we've got the star Delta Valorum is now the South Celestial Pole for us. And um, if we um, look at, um, I'll just scroll out a little bit. Let's do a find. We've got the search window. Let's find Sigma Octantis. And we'll see that the, what, what is currently the South Pole star is nowhere near um, the pole 7,000 years in the future. But the good news is if we wait till then, we'll have a nice bright star near the pole. So that's um, the useful thing about it. Um, the other thing we notice, what, what's caused this is that the axis of the Earth's rotation is slowly drifting. So the North Pole with that rotation is making a slow circle around the sky every 26,000 years, roughly. So it'll eventually come back to near Sigma Octantis, but um, in 7,000 years, it's at a quite different point relative to the stars. Notice another thing here is if you notice the Southern Cross, it's still pointing roughly in the direction of Sigma Octantis, but it's no longer pointing at the South Pole. So um, that means that our method of finding the South Pole using crux isn't going to work anymore. The other thing, you notice that the pointers are looking a bit strange. And um, if we look at um, Rigel Centaurus or Alpha Centauri, it's no longer making a point of pointing towards crux with Hadar. And the reason for that isn't precession. That's this is a different phenomena over here. You notice these um, where it says proper motion, and you'll see that the proper motion of this star or group of stars, Alpha Centauri A, B, and also um, Proxima Centauri, they have a high proper motion. So it's in right ascension. It's nearly um, four and a half thousand milli arc seconds per year. So that's not much in a year, but it's a lot in, in 7,000 years. So it makes the sky look quite different. And in fact, if you look over to the other side of the screen, you'll see that Sirius seems to be a bit out of place for where we expect it to be. And that, that's also because Sirius is quite close to us, only eight years. So its proper motion is fairly high. So the proper motion is the actual motion of the stars um, relative to the background that we see. And this is because all the stars are in orbit around the Milky Way, the ones that are nearer to us appear to change more. So um, the point of this is you can use Stellarium to explore this kind of thing. You can go long into the future and the past, see what the sky is looking like, how things change over time. And um, not just uh, next year, but you can go... Uh, 10,000 years plus or minus to see what effect that has. Um, it won't probably guarantee the exact position of things like the moon and planets because it depends how good the uh, formulas it's using for calculating their positions and how well we know the proper motions and things like that. It's also um, precision isn't just a simple 
wobble of the Earth's axis going around uh, in the sky because the ecliptic is also slowly changing relative to the background chart stars. Luckily, that doesn't change much. It's just a slow wobble. I can't remember the period. It's something of the order of 100,000 years where it wobbles up and down a little bit. So if you want really accurate celestial coordinates, you have to take all that into account, not just the precession. Um, you can also account for atmospheric refraction if you're lower in the sky. So your, um, when your um, computer is controlling a mount, it has a database of stars, which will be based on the year 2000, usually, um, January the first year 2000. So to find out where the stars now, after 20 years, precision has made a measurable difference. And if you're wanting to accurately pinpoint stars for astrophotography, you want to make sure that your mount is actually using the coordinates of the current date, not the ones back in the year 2000. So you probably have to read the manual about your mount and your software to make sure that's being handled correctly. Anyway, um, we can um, go back to um, some other things about Stellarium. It's, um, it's got a configuration of oh, the search window we briefly talked about. Oh, actually, before we do that, I will hit eight, and that should have reset us back to um, now. Make sure that it's done that. Yeah, so we're back to 2020, 18th of May. Okay, I'll uh, just zoom in a bit. Okay, I sort of skipped this out. This is the search window. You can, um, for example, I can type um, Rigel, say, and it gives me, it's giving me some hints here because there's um, Rigel Kentaurus, which is, um, and it gives another name for Rigel Beta Ori. The one that it will use is the one that it's in bold. So if I just say click, it takes me to Rigel, which is um, just setting at the moment or slightly below the horizon. In fact, if we look at the altitude, we'll see that its um, altitude is just negative. So it's just sunk below the horizon. So that's basically how you use the search button. You can um, search for um, comets um, and various other things, provided the comet is loaded up in the database. New comets won't necessarily be in there, but you can um, download them, manually install them, or you can just download them once the Minor Planet Center have updated their database. And um, I'll show you a little bit about that as well. If we go into the configuration window, um, it's got some things here to do with time, um, various options you can see it. Time corrections shows you it's using a, um, a system invented by Espanac and Mo's. Um, extras, you can play with those and go through them. If you um, um, want to see here down the bottom, there's this get catalog function. When you first download Stellarium, it will only have the, sort of the brightest stars. So you want to go down to fainter stars. It's up to you how far you go. I've got, gone up to level eight. The more stars you um, download, the more it has on disk. I think level eight takes you down to about 15th magnitude, which is enough for me, but it's probably not enough if you were doing astrophotography and astrometry with faint objects. Um, you would need um, to go quite a lot fainter than that. Oh, in fact, it tells me the magnitude range there that I've got at the moment. The other important thing here is plugins. There's a number of default ones. Uh, um, the Solar System Editor is one of the default ones. A useful one that I use is Oculus, and I'll explain how that works. You can see the Solar System Editor go into configure on that. And say I wanted to um, 
import and let's see we can play around with the config files i don't want to do that but what i want to do in here is say update my comments i go into here i've got a choice of asteroid and comments and i can download a list from the internet it's got a number of free built-in sources this one here the gideon van buten and one seems to get updated faster than the um, minor planet centers or the m core observable comets um, but you just select which one you want and you say get orbital elements and it's pick those up and you want to if you want all of them, you mark all, and you say, you've got an option of overwriting or just updating. I'm just going to do an update. You will put elements, not the other information. So marked all, add objects, and then it should tell me that it's done. So that's how you update your comets in Stellarium. You can actually manually do it um, from a file. It's... Um, probably for a more advanced user, won't worry about that. Another um, plugin that's quite handy is um, the Oculus. There's lots of others you can play with, you can see there. But the Oculus is what I'm going to show. Um, that brings this little um, box up here, it's the spanner one. So what you can do here is you can say what eyepiece I'm going to use. It's got a number of built-in ones, but you can put your own custom ones from using the manufacturer's data of focal length from apparent field of view, your lenses if you've got Barlow's and what have you, otherwise telescopes, and you can select from the list or otherwise just put in your focal length and your aperture, and away you go. And then what happens is... Say I select um, something on the screen here, select, say, Sirius, and I go to, um, I've got up some ocular set up, so I'll just say, this is the ocular button here. Um, the idea is it's showing you um, the view that you'd see through your eyepiece. So kind of handy if you want to get an idea what the field of view of a particular eyepiece and telescope combination is turn it off and it goes back to who I was before. Okay, so more things in here. I was going to show you this astronomical calculations window. So I bring that up. That's um, quite useful. You can um, bring up um, some object, for example, solar system objects and we can update positions we want to select an object um, how do we do that we can go ephemeris and let's say or let's go mars and we will um, select date and time calculate for mars and what it's done it's done every solar day from the current date up to this date. Um, to see that, we'd have to go, um, we want to actually go forward in time, so that Mars is actually in the sky. Sorry about that, I should have done that first. Um, let's, let's actually go to, say, July, and look over in the east. And we haven't quite got Mars yet, so we'll go a bit further forward. And so you can see um, that's showing you Mars over those dates So um, that I selected. If I want to um, go back to the calculator and then change the date from today, let's go to, say, 1st of August, and we'll go to... Uh, forward in time, so to the end of October. And let's do, instead of every day, we do, say, five days. Calculate. Yeah. Oh, didn't draw it for me. Did I not select something? Oh, I didn't say show. And calculate. It should. And normally it does that for me. Um, let's just try. 
try this. Oh, there you go. Probably why. It hasn't come up yet. So we'll have to fix that up. Uh, that's more like it. So you can see it actually did draw the um, path of Mars over the, the date that I selected. So you can see that thing that it looks a bit strange. That's because um, when you're approaching Martian opposition, it does this retrograde um, motion for a while. If I'd done a longer time range, we'd see a complete uh, like a um, big S on the sky. So that's quite useful in there. Um, you can see things like um, transits, uh, not that common, but you can do transits and get the data for these. There's various other phenomena. You can have, for example, between Ven um, phenomena between Venus and, say, comets, interstellar objects, planets, so and other planets. So it will show, hopefully it will... Um, Calculate, oh, okay, it's showing a conjunction of Mercury and Venus. It's going to happen. Um, oh, actually, according to that, on the 22nd of, um, so you, presumably you have to put a date range in there. So um, let's expand it out a bit. Say so, to November, see if there's anything more interesting happening. It's calculating it. Hopefully it won't take too long or crash on me. So what it should be showing is any incidents between Venus and the planets for the rest of the year. Oh dear, it's going to either take a long time or um, it's going to crash. So I might have given it too much to do. I'm going to kill it. I want to carry on. So you can, um, if you were doing it yourself, you can just um, play around and um, probably um, either wait or put a more narrow time range. Or not between all the planets, but between two particular planets. So just let me um, fix that up. I'll bring Stellarium back into the presentation. Okay. Okay, I might try that again. And um, let's try um, something a bit more forgiving. I'll do the um, phenomena, but let's say um, Jupiter and Saturn. If it'll let us do that, I oh, know. Let's just say planets. Oh, okay. I'll just see why that didn't work. Um, share. How's that working? Uh, sorry about that. I shouldn't have done that. I was, gave it a too wide a date range, and it uh, gave it too much to do. Um, let's try Jupiter and planets up to. November. I think these are fairly new features in Stellarium, so I don't know how well that works. Okay, so it's done that for me up to June. Uh, let's try to there, calculate. Okay, yeah, that's a lot better. So it hasn't found any anything with other... Um, Phenomena, but it's showing when it's gone stationary and prograde and things like that. So um, it's obviously um, not in conjunction with Saturn. It is gradually catching up with Saturn. So um, if I'd made it longer, it should have picked that up on the um, under phenomena. Um, there's graphs you can do in here. So if I um, Go to later tonight and say select Jupiter. Oops. 
and go search. As you can see, it's still below the horizon. So let's go to here, go back to our calculations screen. And we can see here that um, when um, Jupiter is at zero altitude, it's just rising about 20 past nine, transiting after 4 a.m. So if you want to photograph Jupiter, the best time is still 4 a.m. As you can see, it reaches its um, maximum altitude, which is quite good for us. 75 degrees is, is pretty good, so um, you won't have much trouble with seeing with photography at that sort of altitude. So um, if you don't want to get up at 4 in the morning, just wait a couple of months. Each month is equivalent to uh, roughly two hours. So um, later in the year, in the um, late winter, early spring, you um, won't have to stay out too late. Okay. Um, there wasn't too much else I wanted to say about Stellarium. Um, there's a lot of options in it, and um, I don't know how well tested some of them have been. But yeah, play around. You can always um, set everything back. I didn't um, explain actually before we leave it. If you just select an object by um, clicking on it, if you want to unselect, you right click and then it selects nothing. So it tells you what it knows about it. This is um, um, Alpha Indy. And it gives um, some alternate catalogue catalog entries for it, Parkus, SAO, Henry Draper catalogue catalog and so on. Identifies that it's a double star. It gives you the magnitude of the star. It's B minus V colour index. So you can tell from that how red or blue the star is. Um, if you... Um, it gives the coordinates in J2000, which is basically the, when the standard coordinates are published for that particular day. And the program is calculating the coordinates of the current date and time, which is the, the, uh, the um, alt azimuth and the uh, ascension and declination um, of the date you see displayed there. The other things, um, some other interesting coordinates, um, the um, parent sidereal time as well as the current clock time, and the rise transit set times, distance, and a few other things, spectral type, parallax. So it gives a reasonable amount of um, information about the object. When you zoom right in, um, so um, oh, I haven't. I've actually not got the really faint stars turned on at the moment because I turned them off, even though I've got the catalog loaded. But um, so sometimes when you go to really faint stars, it may not show you any of these catalogs because um, Stellarium isn't so great if you get to really faint stars. If I go back and turn them on, um, where are we? Got solar system objects, stars. Um, we want to turn on somewhere in here. We can say the lim limit magnitude, let's say no. Uh, oops. We can go a lot fainter. I'll just type it actually. It's uh, 16. Uh, what not? Let me do that. Yeah. Okay. So there's something slightly weird there. It should actually go a lot fainter now. Hmm, something's gone wrong there. I have to look into that. It's only letting me go down to visual, roughly the limit of visual magnitudes. Anyway, I'll um, just say that the um, I've exited out of Stellarium. The B 
the catalog selection isn't there isn't so good when you get down to faint stars so it's probably not so good to doing for doing anything serious so i'm going to show you another freeware one quickly um called um sky chart or can't do seal and i'll just share that on the screen hopefully you can see that is that coming up steve Okay, I'll have another go. Hmm. Start sharing, sharing. How about that? Okay, uh, it's interesting. So I've shared the screen now rather than the application here. Uh, okay. So this one is a, a, a bit more of a, um, an illustration type um, layout of the sky. And you can see when you drag it, it turns the, the art stuff off. Um, but the advantage, there's two advantages for this program. It's called Can't Do Seal or Sky Chart. It's freeware and... Um, if you Google it, you'll find the official site to get it from. But what this program is, well, there's a couple of things this program is really good at. If you um, want to print charts, when you print from this program, it will print charts in a sensible way. In other words, the sky, instead of being black, will be, or dark blue, will be white. So what that means, if you're printing, you're not going to waste a huge amount of toner or or um, if you're printing on an inkjet, even worse, a whole heap of toner, printing out solid black or solid dark blue. So in Stellarium, there's no real print function. You can capture screenshots, but if you print those, the problem is uh, they're going to waste a lot of toner or ink. So that's quite a useful feature of this program. Um, a lot of the settings are the, uh, basically the same idea. You have to, it's a more of an old fashioned menu system rather than that funny jump up menu that you have on Stellarium. So, this one, it's like a, a normal old style Windows program. Um, it's got a lot of the features, night vision, and so on. But a really different thing under here is catalogs. So we can bring this up. I'm not sure if that's showing because it's opened another window. If I drag it, is that showing, Steve? Okay, but I have to drag it back onto the screen because it opened it on the other screen. So under stars, you've got default catalog extended in Parkus. You can actually use the Gaia data release to catalog. Um, you can... Uh, um, they prepare it for cart to seal in three parts. Um, the first part is about just over a gigabyte in size, goes down to about 15th magnitude. Um, then it's got part two, which goes to fainter magnitudes, part three. Um, if you want part two and three, you have to download them via BitTorrent, and the total compressed size of the catalog is something like 50 or over 40 gigabytes anyway. So um, you want to make sure if you do that, you've got a lot of disk space and it's even more if you uncompress it. Um, but Can't Do Seal actually does allow you to have other catalogs. It supports the UCAC ones. And if you have a, a browse on the website, there's a number of other catalogs you can download and import onto this program. So generally, if you're doing a lot of serious stuff involving astrometry, you'd be wanting to using one of those proper catalogs. In the future, the Gaia one will be the go-to catalog for that sort of purpose. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, um, of course, there are the, I can't show you any of them because I haven't got any of them installed here. There's a lot of pay for ones at the, the um, the start, we use the, the Sky X, 
for both the ZEISS now that it's been automated and also the research scope there. And also out at CAMU Observatory, apart from the Sky X being a great bit of software, it's um, also because all of those three telescopes are using software BISC hardware, and the Sky X is software BISC um, written software, so it makes sense to use that with the the um, the uh, software BISC mounts and mount hardware. Um, but for your own use on your own, there's a lot of them you can use if you want to use free ones or pay for ones. Um, Sky Safari on phones, and I'll talk about that a bit too. Um, phones can do a lot of these things as well. If you um, don't want to use a laptop or something out, out with your telescope, you can actually do a lot of this sort of thing from a phone, even remote control of your telescope, which Stellarium and this can't do, seal can, can do. So I won't um, show you much in Cart to Seal because it's got a lot of the same kind of features that are in Stellarium. So I'll just finish off showing you um, mobile phone application. Um, if you just give me a minute to set that up and I can, I can broadcast the phone screen. So I'll close down the Cart to Seal window. Okay, now if I just um, go back into Teams, I'll have to check with Steve again that I've got um, the screen showing up. Oh, okay, oh, it's because it's on the, it was on the screen rather than the application. So um, what I'm doing now is just using the phone like you'd use a mobile phone and the screen is being um, displayed on the laptop. So just swiping to the side. Um, this is an Android phone, by the way. You can, it's probably similar apps for um, iPhone, where you can see the screen on a, on a computer. So this is um, Sky Safari. Um, the interesting thing about these um, apps is that if you turn them on, you can um, set a mode where, um, if I think it's Orbit, is that the right one? Um, uh, no, that's not it. Hang on, let me go out of that. And um, let's turn all of it off. Oh, right, that's, I uh, couldn't see it because it's gone off my screen. Hang on. Oh, right, that's how you get out of that mode. <laughs> okay, Steve is the expert on this app. Um, okay, so what I wanted to show, I think it's compass mode. So what that's doing is it's taking your GPS coordinates and and the current time on the phone, and I'm tilting the phone, and you can see that if I tilt it up at the sky, it's basically um, showing me what I'm pointing the phone at. I don't know, it may depend on how accurate it is, how good the um, coordinates and the tilt meter is in your phone. Uh, you can see the, it's kind of a cool function if, for use outside. You can just um, point your phone at the sky and you can see on the screen of the phone, it'll identify stars for you. Um, so on this program, that's compass mode. This um, isn't a freeware one, it's, um, but it's pretty reasonable price and it's got a lot of really good features in it. Um, I've turned compass mode off, so now I'm just back where I'm just drag dragging around the screen. I can just click on a star on the screen and then if I go down here, um, I can go information. And this is something that... Um, this um, program is really great compared to the freeware Sky Safari, sorry, Stellarium and Cart to Seal. It gives a lot more information. The screen um, is just telling you um, similar kind of information to the other programs, but actually more. 
But if you go into description, it then tells you a lot of stuff about it. And this is really useful for um, learning a bit more about the objects. And there's a lot of this stuff in Sky Safari for a lot of deep sky objects. And um, yeah, so um, there are free ones as well, and, and they work really well, but um, I uh, happen to particularly like this one. Um, you can actually uh, change similarly under. Oops, I've gone out of it, sorry. Let me um, pick it back up again. So um, you've got um, a lot of things you can change, like your date, time, location, um, a lot of um, settings. You can also, one really cool thing you can do with this, if you've got a mount, um, I think some of the Ioptron mounts have Wi-Fi built in, or you can get a Wi-Fi dongle you plug into the mount, you can control your scope by wireless remote control. So you could be um, have your scope outside as long as it's within Wi-Fi range and operate your um, your um, telescope via a phone. Um, pretty cool. In fact, I think um, Steve actually played a joke on somebody uh, doing that one time where he said this particular mount was voice control and he was using a phone using Wi-Fi to do it, but um, somebody was... Um, they got the victim of the um, of the practical joke to talk to the mount and tell it to go to Jupiter or whatever. Of course, they were just selecting Jupiter on the phone and doing a go-to operation. So that was quite amusing. So um, that's probably enough. I, um, um, I didn't really uh, – I sort of skipped over and um, – Stellarium um, under deep sky section. I didn't really go into that, but you can select which deep sky catalog catalog are displayed, like Messier, Caldwell, NGC, and all that kind of stuff. So download these programs and play with them. They really, really are worth well and great aid. And if if you need to get a pay for one, um, then sure, there's some really great ones out there. So, um, Steve, I'll hand back to you. Do we have any questions that I might try to answer? Uh, we've got a couple. We've got uh, time for some more if anybody wants to ask a couple of questions. But while you've got um, Sky Safari on the screen there, Bill, uh, one of the oh, cool yeah, you features... you want to show something? Yeah, one of the cool features that I really like, you actually clicked on it earlier, but... Um, if oh, you can, fly out to. Yeah, the fly out to. So um, if you pick uh, Jupiter Let's... or something and then okay. do the orbit function. Right, so... Um... Let's um, go. Is it, oh, yeah, it's got planets. So if we can just select Jupiter and then the orbit button. So that'll fly us out to um, Jupiter and show us. I presume you can do this on stars out in the galaxies and deep sky objects. Yeah, you can. Not on all the stars, but the ones where the sort of three dimensional position is reasonably accurately known, the close by ones. Right. Um, if you okay. were to pick Alpha Centauri, for example. Um, and the really interesting thing when you do that is you get to see the, the change in shape of our familiar constellations. So you can right. um, move out to Alpha Centauri, put your constellation lines on, and see that um, what the constellations look like from a different viewpoint. Yeah, we should do that, actually, just to show that. Um, this is just dragging around so you can see where the, the moons are and the other planets relative to Jupiter. See the Milky Way peering in the background. Um, Io, what happens if we point it at the sun? <laughs> so there we're looking back towards the Earth and the sun and so on. So um, I'll just try that, actually. It's, um, so you, select, you can just uh, click on an object and, uh, and do... Oh, right, yeah, well. but I was going to select Alpha Centauri. Uh, just to do that. This one doesn't actually give you suggestions, which is something quite useful in Sky Safari. As you're typing, it comes up with suggestions. So let's go to that one, and we go orbit. So we're flying off to Alpha Centauri. And if we drag around the sky, 
it's not actually showing us. I wonder if we can tell if we're looking towards back towards the sun. Oh, there it is. So that's looking back towards the sun. So kind of interesting. So actually from um, from Alpha Centauri, it looks like the sun is kind of in the Milky Way. You can spend hours and hours just um, moving it. around the solar system, moving around the galaxy. Mm. Yeah. Um, anyway. Oh, okay, um, a couple of other questions. Um, so questions. Um, John Drummond's asked a few questions. The first one you answered... Oh, in, no, there'll be hard ones. <laughs> oh, not really. The first one you answered uh, actually in the uh, during your presentation, but it'd be uh, interesting to apply that to your other software as well and he said can current comments be ad uh, comments rather be added or displayed in Stellarium so you covered that for that um, but oh yeah you, you do it CL... through that um, plugins solar system plugin screen and I found for example for the new comets F8 Swan um, that didn't appear on the minor planet center list for quite a long time but it was in in that um, first um, one on the list that, that was the first one that got updated and so that's how I got it into um, Stellarium. Um, and the you can add also comets into Sky Safari and Cart du Ciel. In a, in a yeah, the, the, um, they talk to the Minor Planet Center, and and there are other ways of like manually into if you've got the orbital el elements, you can I believe you can even manually put them in. Um, so another question from John actually is, have you tried to control your mount or telescope with it, Bill? Um, were you successful? Um, with Stellarium, I don't have a robotic mount, um, so the answer is no, but I believe others have. Have you tried that, Steve? Yeah. Absolutely. I know you've used Sky Safari to do it. I've, uh, I've used all three of those, actually. Um, so um, you can get software to make them all work together. So with the ASCON platform, you can actually share... Um, different applications control of your mount at the same time. So I've used Sky Safari and Stellarium and Cart du Ciel all at the same time controlling a mount. Right. Obviously, with a phone, you'll be doing it via wireless. Normally. Yes, you can. Uh, oh, no, there there is some software which will allow you to run the wireless part of uh, the connectivity through Stellarium or through through your computer, through ASCOM. So it is possible to connect your computer right. up using um, serial cable, if that's what you have for your mount, and you can run a piece of software which will then provide a Wi-Fi connection for um, Sky Safari. And that's another right. thing that I've done. Yeah, I know some of the very recent mounts have Wi-Fi built in, and I presume if they, they would be compatible with talking direct to a phone. Yeah, a Sky Safari is the the sort of archetype for um, for good astronomy software, and pretty much everybody makes sure that the mounts work with Sky Safari. Mm. It's quite common. Yeah, um, I, I haven't actually got the latest version here. I think it's version five. I don't think if you go to a major version update, I think you have to pay for the update. It's not a huge amount, but um, um, I think it is worth it for that program. It's got a lot of features in it. Very educational as well with the fly out to the galaxy function. Uh, and the last question they have here, unless anybody gets another question in quickly, is um, dumb question: Can you use Sky Safari on a PC instead of a phone? Not that I know of. <laughs> uh, no, I'll, I know the answer to that as well. I'll answer all the questions. Um, it is possible to run it on a Mac. Um, so it does, there is uh, a version of Sky Safari for Mac OS. Uh, it's not okay. possible to run it on a PC, only Android, iOS, and Mac. Uh, but there are it plenty might of other be, software. It might be possible to do it under Linux because I read somewhere that you can actually run an an Android simulator under Linux. And um, that's actually true on a PC as well. There are a number of Android um, virtual whether, machines. How well it would work, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But that's all for the questions that have been asked in the chat. Thanks very much for that, Bill. I thought it was really interesting. I certainly learned some things about Stellarium that I didn't know how to use. So, um, yeah, really appreciate it. Some things um, didn't quite work the way I'd expect. <laughs> but anyway. Fantastic. But, um, if you play around with these programs, it's the best way to 
um, try out all the options and see what happens. Thank okay, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve.